You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to Addressing Gettysburg. I'm uh, sitting here with Eric, the producer. Hello, Eric. Howdy, howdy. And uh, we, this is the first episode of um, basically our backlog of Patreon uh, material. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't get it, this is like all basically we do. And uh, so we have Patreon in order to keep it going so that we can have free content. And so um, we started it about a year ago, actually a little over, no, a year and a half ago. Yeah. And the, uh, the material from that period is now old enough where I'm going to start releasing it. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to start going through the backlog and twice a month you will get an old Patreon episode. Uh, the, the ones that are coming out currently, um, they won't be out for another year. Uh, and that's one of the things that being a, a patron uh, gets you is that you get this material long before everybody else does. And uh, that's about it. So yeah. this one is one that we did called Killed at Gettysburg with Dr. Ashley Whitehead Lusky from the uh, Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College. And it's a very uh, interesting one. It's about um, this website that they have and this project that uh, has been going on for years over there at the college. Uh, chronicling the uh, killed at Gettysburg. Yeah, it's a really neat project. It is. Actually. And so Ashley came into the old studio and sat down and talked about it with us, and this is it. And if you enjoy this content and you want to hear it sooner than a year from when it's released, please consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Enjoy. So like we were saying, it started in 2017. Yes. And um, who, did, were you there at the time? No. So it actually it began in Pete Carmichael's class. I believe it was the Civil War or Gettysburg and History and Memory might have been the class. Okay. Um, and so the students who were in that class were kind of spearheading it to start. Um, and that's when it was kind of narrowly defined in in terms of the length of the profiles, in terms of what soldiers were being targeted for it. Um, originally, it was set up so that the soldiers would all be Union soldiers who are buried in the National Cemetery. So someone, say, could go to Gettysburg, visit the grave of one specific soldier, and then tap into this website and say, oh, I'm going to follow this person's journey from right. their hometown, you know, why they signed up, family background, all the way up through Gettysburg itself, uh, the final footsteps part that we have in the map component of the project, and then looking at the legacy, the impact of their death uh, on their family and their community. Um, I think that's a really cool idea. Um, what, how, how do you find all that information? Well, first of all, let's, I guess let's go back for a second. Yeah. There's more than 7,000 that died in the battle. Yes. Um, how many do you have on the, on the website so far? I want to say we have maybe 15 to 20. Okay. Maybe a little over 20. So it takes a while to do. It does. Um, because you're, you're trying to get as much of um, as much biographical information on these people as you can. Yes. And then tell the story of their death and you yes. got to research it. Who's researching it? So we have a combination of students. We have um, students from our fellows program at the Civil War Institute, which is basically a work study program. Mm -hmm. um, those are usually sophomores, juniors, and seniors who get paid to do research and writing projects. Um, so they're working on some of them. But then we also have first year students who've been kind of brought into the CWI through this project. And we take them down to the National Archives to do research, kind of introduce them to the historical craft, take them up to the Park Service um, to work with John Heiser, looking up some research about their soldier. Um, so they've also been working on the project first years and then students from the fellows program. So a small group of students. Uh, but as you said, each profile takes a long time to sure. dig up all the necessary information. It's also a practice in helping the students um, 
learn the historian's writing craft. And so there's a lot of peer editing, peer workshops, talking about writing, talking about interpretation for a public audience. Um, so that's a huge component of it too, is kind of finessing the writing skills and then learning the digital tools. So that takes a while. Can non-students help with this? This sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, and we've had that question actually um, from a couple of people who've I think been to the site and have wanted to get involved. And to this point, we have said no, just because it's so time intensive. Yes, we're, <laughs> we're mean and exclusive. <laughs> um, it just takes so long to do these yeah. posts that we really have to have the students or the people that we're working with right there with us so yeah. that we can have these meetings, sit down with people. Um, and students have the time. Yes, <laughs> we're, right. we try to make them have the time. <laughs> Actually, how long does it take? from assignment of student or of soldier to completion posted on the website for the student fellows it's usually been a semester per soldier um for the first year students um because they are adjusting to everything new about college life as well as doing this new history project it's usually a full school year that it takes to get a profile okay. up. Ooh. And once once their work is complete, is there like an editor in chief? Is that you? Uh, what what happens after their work is submitted? Yeah. So I look at their work every step of the way. We break it down into kind of bite sized portions so that they don't get overwhelmed to start out with. Mm -hmm. And then we'll sit down and we'll workshop. Say everyone submits. Um, the pre-Gettysburg section, the family section, the community, the reasons for enlistment, that kind of stuff. We sit down, we circulate them beforehand, the students take a look at them, and then we talk about um, big interpretive ideas, kind of strengths and weaknesses, what they were hoping to accomplish, have they accomplished it yet? And then they'll go back and they'll take those edits that I've given them and that their peers have given them, and they'll bring it back for another revision. Um, and then we'll do that until the end of the semester when everything is submitted. I always make sure that they sign off on any changes or suggestions I have for them. And then they're the ones who actually post on the website. So they learn the digital tools, they'll go through and post everything and I'll take just one final look at it before it goes live. Do, do you ever find that some work that's been submitted by a student might have pretty major factual errors or anything? Um, Every now and then something will come up that I think is just um, maybe a typo or something slipped their mind. They've been pretty, pretty good, pretty thorough about um, making sure their facts are right. And, you know, that rigorous back and forth that we have those editing the sessions. Editing, yeah, 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 that really helps to get rid of any mistakes that do come up because that's one of the things. I mean, this is a student project, so we right. want this to be predominantly their work. But we don't want to have a lot of, you know, mistakes out there. There are going to be things that fall through here and there, um, but big mistakes, you know, we definitely want to correct. Now, on the website, there's an interesting map where there's points on the map at Gettysburg where um, monuments or farms or areas where that particular unit was. Mm -hmm. Is that the work of the students too, or is that more you, or is there? Yes, that is the students too. Um, they get trained in the ArcGIS Story Map program, okay. uh, which is a tool that we've learned through um, the library at Gettysburg College, their digital um, resources team that comes in and gives them a workshop on how to use these tools, WordPress, Flickr, the Story Map. And then the students um, are in charge of transporting themselves out there to the battlefield finding out where their unit was, any landmarks that their particular soldier might be associated with, taking photos um, that you know capture moments in time, you know, this is what the soldier would have seen at this point in the battle, and then writing some interpretive captions. And then they learn how to actually plant the pin using the GIS technology as to where they mm. were when they took that cool. picture. Cool, so as a former educator, I like the multi, disciplinary approach to this whole thing yes. learning a couple of different yes. skills and sometimes they have to get creative about how they get out there i have some students who are avid runners who take 10 mile runs and then they'll just stop and take their story map <laughs> pictures while they're out and then they'll run back and upload them so um, it's fun i think for them to go out there in one case i noticed uh, um is it major carney from the 11th yeah. new jersey yeah uh his grave is in new york state would yes. the kid have gone there to take that photograph or gotten that picture offline or something? so in those instances and that's again another development in the project um 
where soldiers who the students found that they really wanted to research them, but they're not in the cemetery or they're probably in the cemetery, but in the sea of unknowns, mm. um, we started saying, well, maybe the map can go a little bit beyond Gettysburg and they can find a picture that's obviously not copyright, um, get a picture of the grave, and then they can plant the pin on the GIS technology for where that, that um, Grave that gravestone is, is. Mm-hmm. Um, so they don't actually have to go there as long as the the picture they use is fair use. It's fine. Okay. And yeah. you said that uh, it takes about a year to get a profile up. Yeah, for a first year student. For a first year student, but how many profiles on average are you getting up in a year? Um, so it depends on how many student workers we have and how many first year students we have. Um, last year we got up. Well, one student took on two soldiers per semester, which was very ambitious. Um, so I want to say, I think we got maybe nine last year. So we probably have upwards of maybe maybe twenty five on the site now. Yeah, that I something think about like that. It. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it just depends on how fast they work. So what did you? How did? How many did you say in a year? Um, we got, I think, maybe nine last nine. year. Nine. Okay, yeah. so that's pretty good. Yeah. So let, let's see how many. Thousands of years would that take you to do? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the question that we get all the time is, yeah. all right, so where do you cut this thing off? And if you're not going to do all 7,000, then what's the point of it? No, um, you have to do all 7,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but this is this is a, this is is a like a legacy thing. Like, this is something that will continue for generations. I would hope that this continues. Um, we're trying to spread more awareness about it, um, writing up little blog posts and things uh, that we send out to other websites to get people more aware of it right. the park service also helps to spread the word what do you need like what do you need people to do and support wise like uh, people listening now like what can they do to help it grow so i would say spread the word share the website yeah. share the links um make sure people know about it sometimes we actually we get people writing in who say I have an ancestor and I have letters and I have a photo. Right. Would you be able to take my soldier and write mm. about him? And, and we've done know, that. And now he was killed at Gettysburg. Yeah. Yes. Very yes. Cool. And in they, fact, that was a question I, that I had. Somebody asked me, like, do they, oh, do they look up your relative if you know you have one? Because somebody, right. one of my, I think it was a Facebook follower, said that they have a relative they know who died here. Yes. But they don't really know anything about him beforehand. Yes. And they're not really into researching and all that other stuff. Right. And they, they wanted me to ask you, like, could you do yeah. that if they give you the name and everything? Could they, yeah. could you guys look into the person? I mean, why not? If you're going to yeah. do all 7,000. Yeah. I mean, right. well, what does it matter where it's coming from? <laughs> we add it to the files. We have so many. I mean, part of the, the challenge with that is obviously we're not a, a research institution because we have just a small number of students. Um, and there are, we want to give the students some choice in who they pick. Um, so you don't want to necessarily always assign them a soldier unless they're completely lost or don't know where to begin and they want a soldier's name given to them. Um, but we've done that a couple of times. But could, could, couldn't it be something that you did open to the public to come in and help with, but the students take the lead on things? Because yeah. I, I would imagine that there, there are people that they may not have as much time to do sure. it, but whatever free time, like retired people. Yeah. Like right. they would have free time. Right. And, right. and you know, any bit of help could help. Sure. <laughs> right? And I think the thing that's most helpful is if people do contact us with some documents or a research lead or photos, um, sometimes students start with just the name of a soldier. They really have absolutely no idea what his story is. They want that challenge, you know, not mm-hmm. knowing anything going mm-hmm. in. And they come up with some pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Other times, they have been given a research lead. One student took on Philip Hamlin, who was a sergeant in the first Minnesota, um, and he had 95 pages of typed letters uh, between him and his family. Now, that profile was incredibly rich because we had a picture, we had letters, we had the background info. So the more we have about the soldier, the richer the profile is going to be. Hmm. So I would say that would probably be the, the most helpful thing is if people could supply us with maybe some background information to help sure. whoever's doing it create a richer right. profile. Right, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and how do they, the names, they come from themselves? Or do you just assign a name to the person if they don't have yeah, a Yeah, that's a good yeah. question. What's the process of... So some of them have, you know, they're, usually these students are pretty um, passionate, uh, budding Civil War historians, so they've done a lot of reading, and they've heard a name on a tour 
or in a book that they're reading and they say, I want to, you know, research this individual. Other times they'll say, you know, I just want to start from scratch and pick someone I don't know. So we um, send them to the Busey and Busey book, uh, the register of all the dead and wounded um, at Gettysburg. And they have sometimes little vignettes in there, just, you know, a few lines here or there that tells where they were wounded or where they came from or how old they were. And that's where they sometimes get their names Mm -hmm. uh, is from that book. And then from there, they're off and running into the census records, compiled service records, pension records, newspapers. Some of them have even gone so far as contacting local historical societies in towns with like a thousand people in them. Mm. Um, Church records, anything that they can find. And the harder they dig, uh, the more interesting material, of course, they come up with. A lot of it is digitally available to them, which is great because they don't have the means to go and do a lot of you know, far-reaching research. But we do take them down to Washington, D.C., to the National Archives uh, to get uh, the experience of going through those compiled service records, uh, the experience of looking up the widow's pensions, which can tell just a wealth of Mm. information Mm. um, and other documents that might be kind of tagged in with those. Uh, And then they go, as I said, up to the park and they look through regimental files. They look at regimental histories on their own. So they try to do as much of it as they can digitally, um, but then we also make sure that they get the the primary research component mixed in. And I should say with that too, these are these are small profiles. They're not books on these soldiers. Some soldiers right. could obviously have a book written, and so the information is obviously going to be incomplete. Um, but we tell them, you know, do as much as you can with the sources you have. We by no means think that these are definitive profiles that, you know, are the be all and end all. Um, there are questions that sometimes arise in the record where the student will read in the compiled service record. They, this soldier was killed in Pickett's charge, or then they'll read, no, he was actually wounded and he lingered on for two more months. Then they'll read, no, he actually was wounded and survived for six months and went home and then he died. And so they know Mm -hmm. that there are questions that are open-ended, but that teaches them the humility of the historian's Mm. craft. Yeah. Um, So it's it's letting them know that they can make informed speculation where they don't have definitive answers as long as they say, perhaps, blah, 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 or it can be surmised that blah, 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 blah. And that the evidence is there to make an informed speculation and not just throwing random stuff at people and how are they re- like do, do they get into this are they enthusiastic about this project i'd imagine they would be yes they are um and it's very endearing to yeah. see i guess especially because for so many of them this is their first time delving into these primary source records i remember the one time the first year i was here we took the first year students down to the national archives and the one student um who was working on philip hamlin was so into philip hamlin's story he got the compiled service record and he said Dr. Lusky, this might be an embarrassing question, but are these like real? And I just had to laugh because he was so excited that he, he actually got to the touch actual, yes, yeah, the actual yeah. CSRs. Um, and, you know, some of these students at the end, they'll feel connected to yeah. these guys. You know, one of them actually printed out a blown up photo of their soldier oh. after and put it up in their room. Oh, cool. Um, so, yeah, they do get really involved, which is, is endearing. Yeah, um, that is nice. Yeah. And it's nice to see that they actually like can you know like that they can actually see something because they're not used to tangible things like paper right make that connection so they can make that connection right that that's what we experience on the battlefield all the time people say wow i can't believe this happened right here right Right. were these rocks here right (laughs) no we blow them up every (laughs) night i mean (laughs) right right. (laughs) yeah this is the place right this is it and there is that human desire to make a connection with history like that and your kids are doing it and that's what we always what part of the original goal of this project was was to take place-based history so actual concrete places on the battlefield and connect those places to broader stories beyond the battlefield yes the soldier fought and died or was mortally wounded here but let's think about the bigger ideas and the bigger themes about the civil war that can be addressed when we talk about that soldier and so just by standing next to that, you know, cracked rock in Rose's wheat field, um, thinking about, you know, whatever soldier from the second South Carolina or whoever you're working on who might have have been found there, you can connect that to ideas about honor, about slavery, about 
faith about notions of uh, the good death, Victorian notions mm. of the good death, mm. about memorialization, um, about how communities dealt with the economic, af- you know, impacts of the battle um, with, you know, widows and orphans left behind. And so it's really taking, starting out with that nugget, that one physical place, and then kind of building backwards into what are the big ideas that can be drawn from this soldier's story and, and why are they still important? To right. Us? And as a researcher, it's got to be easier for some, Hamlin with mm-hmm. 95 pages. Yes. Versus um, others, <clears throat> a Minion or Ninian, if not, however yes. we're pronouncing his <laughs> name, where there's just not a lot there. Right. And I, I found it interesting how the researchers, or maybe this is your influence, I don't know, you'll see the word probably mm-hmm. a lot. Because mm-hmm. in, in the case of George Washington Buck, a sergeant from the 20th Maine, mm-hmm. there's Thomas Garish's account that you can say, well, he probably was thinking this. Right. Like we do have this account yes. from a, another member of the 20th Maine. Yeah. And uh, I, I appreciated that, but that's got to be harder. Some of your kids must the kids. I'm sorry. I'm old. I'm 63. <laughs> <laughs> he was a middle school teacher. So kids. <laughs> yeah. Some of your researchers must say, oh, man, I got someone with nothing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now I've got to research all these other people to try to figure out what was in his mind. Right. Right. And that's, again, I think what is part of the richness of this project is that they really learn how to take very bare bones evidence and read secondary source material about, you know, what big ideas can be per- perhaps extrapolated from this experience or looking at, you know, other people's accounts to kind of fill in the lines and make those kind of informed speculations um, that, again, it's it's a practice in humility. It's a practice in deep archival research, be, you know, reading between the lines, trying to fill in the, the puzzle pieces. Um, and usually even with you know, someone who has very little. One student did a, a private from Alabama, uh, one of two brothers who came from kind of lower class Alabama town. Not much there. He chose him, I think, just from a list of soldiers that I had compiled. This guy um, was actually brought to the Adam Butt Farm, which is where I live, so just up the street from mm-hmm. here. Um, and so I put him on the list saying, I wonder if a, a student would want to research him. And so he took this this soldier and he kind of wondered, well, you know, how am I going to tell a story about this guy? He's a private, you know, there's not anything written from him. And by the time he got to the end of it, he was, you know, telling stories about um, the impact of the two brothers being away in battle, how that deprived the family at home of workers, about what a lowly you know, farmer from Alabama, what stake he possibly could have had in the Southern cause when mm. the family was not a slaveholding family, um, but they still obviously had a stake in, you know, the slaveholding economy. He was talking about the monument, the Alabama monument, um, which, you know, has that iconic, you know, the woman is the spirit of Alabama, mm. I guess, pointing, you know, the sons where to go and kind of linking that to is that kind of the defense of home and women back at home that are directing, you know, this son, this brother uh, to go and fight for protection of home and hearth. So he was able to to find ways to tap into big ideas that I think going into it, he must have been a little flustered that there wasn't much there. Do you find that, um, especially when studying the Confederates, that maybe the preconceived notions that the students may have had going into this about who these people were yes. is kind of shattered? Yes. Okay. And that's one of the things that I try to open their eyes about because the project started out as, as union focused, obviously, right. with the cemetery. Uh, burials, And then I thought, well, we really need to expand this to Confederates, especially since we're using Union soldiers who aren't buried in the cemetery. They're, you know, so we're not it, limited it, to that. Anymore. It could have been manageable. But then he said, no, no, let's yeah, just double it. Yeah, we had it. to add and a few more thousand <laughs> into the group. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. No, but so go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, and so some of the students that I have, um, you know, are are reticent about doing this, investing so much time into a Confederate soldier. Um, mm. You know, they personally don't agree with the Confederate cause. I, I don't think many of us no, would agree with them still, today. Yeah. Um, but I try to tell them that's not the point of history. The point of history is to do good research and understanding these people, why they made the decisions they made, not making a moral judgment, um, helping people understand the complexities of the past. And so sometimes I actually had to force their hand and say, 
you've done three Union soldiers so far, you're going to do a Confederate this time. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of the, uh, you know, the, that can be boiled down into one sentence. He was a slaveholder. And you have to say, wait a minute, you know, let's, let's back up a little bit. Um, there are a lot of complexities here. And I think they are. They come out the other side and they realize, OK, there's a lot of humanity here to unpack. There's a lot of complexities to this guy's story. Definitely don't agree with him. Definitely wouldn't have followed in his footsteps. But I understand why he made these decisions. But what would they have done if they were that poor Alabama farmer who couldn't afford a slave, but right. you live in Alabama? Right. Like, what are you going to do? Right. And, and, and you, you, there's a lot that goes into why these guys went and fought. Sure. And slavery, I don't really, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't, I, I would imagine for that guy and mm -hmm. the thousands of others like him, slavery yeah. really wasn't a thing. For him, I think, you know, even though he is from this lower class, those people in those classes, they obviously, right. they wanted to aspire to being slaveholders. Um, it's kind of like capitalists today. How many of us are CEOs of a company? Well, right. very few, but how many of us would love to be? Well, right. Probably and a lot of yeah. us. How many um, of us don't want to get rid of rich people because we right. want to be one day? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many of us benefit from the system? A lot of us. It's kind of the same, you know, with slavery and, the, and these poor farmers. And even if they didn't own slaves, they probably hired one out from time to time to do work for them on the farm. Mm -hmm. um, so they were connected into that economy. There's and if, also the, this, if the slaves were freed, they'd be competing for jobs. Sure, sure. And there's the social component that yeah. if the black population is always going to be enslaved, they're always going to be above someone else in right. society. Right. So th they do have a stake, but that lowly farmer's experience is very different from, say, uh, Benjamin Watkins Lee, who was the adjutant to uh, Johnson. Um, and he was Allegheny a Johnson, Allegheny divisional Johnson, commander yes. in the old Second Corps um, of the Confederate Army. And so he was a major slaveholder from Richmond, extremely wealthy. That wealth was rooted in the slave economy. And so the student, you know, who wanted or who ultimately got assigned to him, he was a little wary. He wasn't, he wanted to do a Union soldier and he didn't want to do necessarily a major slaveholder. But at the end of it, there are a lot of interesting things to unpack about that soldier. And I think by the time that this student came to the other side of the project, and I think he did a really good job with it too, um, he really helped to understand the dynamics of that soldier, the choices that he had in his vision because of his class and because of his race um, and because of gendered conventions of manhood that were, you know, rooted uh, in, in the slaveholding economy. And I think he understood it better, uh, even if he still vehemently disagreed, you know, with the cause. I always say. What's Batman without the Joker, right? Like, I don't, I understand you don't want to, I, I don't think learning about the bad guy. Yeah. yeah and I'm using my quotey fingers there. Mm -hmm. um, is an endorsement of the bad guy. Absolutely. You have to know evil in order to recognize good and side with good. You can't just say, well, these guys are good because they won. And so I don't want to learn about the other guys. Sure. You're doing yourself no favors. Right. By having that attitude. That's a purposefully ignorant attitude to have. Sure. As yes. we sit here in 2019 in a very divided <clears throat> America, uh, impeachment hearings, sure. decisions right. going on as we speak, the, the words evil, and I know you used them with air quotes just now yeah. and all that, and I know you didn't intend to say that the Southerners were evil and the Northerners were... No, no, no. That's the know, attitude. Of light. That's right. the attitude that I just want to make sure we don't lose all of our Southern no, Southern no, no, listenership. No, 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 no. Yeah. No, in fact, I'm, I'm defending <laughs> right. I'm defending the Southerners in, in, in the sense of exactly. learning about them. Exactly. And, and I don't mean to, you know, by, by you know, joke, the Joker is obviously the villain. I'm not saying the Southerners are villains, but there is a um, us against, you know, there's right. there's opponents. And the, the, the Union thought the South was the bad guys. The South right. thought the North was the bad guys. And that's and Mike makes right. And the North won. That's so. <laughs> the real reason I jumped in here is um, I heard the word evil and I know what I know your heart and mind. So I know that's not where you want yeah, to go. No, I wasn't doing that. What, what I love about this, um, and I, I, I also get this from Dr. Peter Carmichael's book, The, the War for the Common Soldier. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I want to ask you, is it Dr. Lusky or Ashley? I don't know what... Oh, well, the students call me doctor, but you can call me Ashley, <laughs> certainly. <Okay. laughs> Dr. <Doctor> Ashley. <laughs> the, um, the thing I love about both of these, and I'm going to ask you a little bit later about on how they interact with each other, how they influenced each other, mm -hmm. is providing this context which introduces us to the very 
humanity of these people. Yes. And tying that in today, we, we use words like evil, those evil Republicans or those evil Democrats. Right. And it, it's my belief that that is not productive right. to us as a country to demonize our political enemies because it's not too far of a jump from that to the getting Holocaust. involved in a war like right. like we were in 1861 mm-hmm. to 1865. Right. And so I love the context. Sure. And maybe you could spend a little bit. I know I, I read about this, about the project, but what can you just explain the whole broad sweep that you're telling the students again? I th- I've heard pieces of it, but uh, I don't think I've heard all of it. And so just uh, it's chronological, right? Um, about the placing these soldiers, if I'm remembering right, it's like what their life was like before. Yes. Why they're doing this as best you can tell. Mm-hmm what's happening here at Gettysburg, mm-hmm. but then what else? It yeah. doesn't, doesn't end here. Right, right. Yes, so that's correct. Um, so yes, we start with the family dynamics, the background, because so many of these guys are being kind of teed up for what they will ultimately do in the war based on region, based on the class of their family, uh, based upon their education uh, when they were young, things like that. Um, So we look at family, we look at community. If we know the politics of the community they came from, um, we delve into that as possible reasons, motivations for enlistment. Um, And then we go into the pre-Gettysburg section. So, and this is something that I've asked them to expand a little bit more on um, from where the project started uh, in Pete's class, looking at how their experiences before Gettysburg shaped how they felt when they got to Gettysburg itself, because I think that's a vital component Um, that these guys weren't just beamed here from, you know, Mississippi or from Vermont. They were building, and every experience that they had before Gettysburg shaped them in a a fundamental way. And so oftentimes the soldier they are when they arrive here in July of 1863 is very different from the soldier that they were in April of 1861 Mm -hmm. or in August of that year when they signed up. So then we look at the Gettysburg experience itself, their final footsteps from when they arrived on the field, where they moved about, if they watched part of the battle before they actually got involved, we include that, their particular role in the battle. And then as you said, um, it doesn't end here in Gettysburg because that would be to tell an incomplete story. We have to follow the news of their death back to their community. Mm -hmm. How did the family respond? What choices did uh, the widow make who was left behind? Um, did she remarry simply out of, uh, oh my God, I can't continue to live this life by myself, or I was entitled to certain things as a privileged Southern lady, and I need to have that class status to know my identity and to fulfill certain you know, feminine duties? Right. Or is it, I am going to live like a strong woman on my own, I'm never going to remarry, I'm going to go into the workforce, and I'm going to become kind of a newly remade woman. So we tell stories about gender from you know, the woman's side. We look at how the community reels in some cases, um, you know, some of these units are almost wiped out at Gettysburg. And so how does a community respond to that? Sometimes in the case of um, one soldier that um, a first year student did last year, um, there was a community in Vermont that basically turns inward and helps to uh, support almost 100 percent the father of this young private who died here at Gettysburg because his other son had joined up. He had deserted and run away. No one knew where he was. His daughter had remained in Canada. They were Canadian immigrants. He himself was old and infirm. The mother had died years ago. He had nothing left. And so that you know transforms communities mm. uh, in certain ways. We also look at how the, the veterans themselves deal with not only individual losses, but collective losses. Mm-hmm. So when they come back to the battlefield to dedicate the regimental uh, markers, what does the marker look like? Why did maybe they choose that design? What does the caption kind of say about the collective soldiers' services um, and how that memory has kind of been reshaped over the years? So the legacy piece is just as important as the other two components. What um, would you have a favorite that you that's on the website so far as far as? It's like picking a favorite child. I always say it a few. Remember, your students are listening. I know. I know. I think, no, no, no. I'm not saying just the favorite death story, not necessarily the work done on. Okay. Death. Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, because I think I just have to say all of these students I think have done an amazing job, and the fact that the profiles are up there means that. 
they have passed muster, no pun intended. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And so there are so many different ways that these students have dealt with these soldiers. um, And I just think that they're all just so excellent. Um, And they're all great. I mean, the profiles you read them, they they seem professionally done. They're very good. Yeah. So, I mean, they put in so much hard work. You could tell. You could tell. And one of the great things, too, is that sometimes we do have a couple of overlaps, you know, two soldiers from the same unit. And sometimes when a student picks that soldier, they say, oh, I don't know if I should because there's already one, you know, from the 5th New Hampshire, we have two. Mm -hmm. But the stories are so different. The themes that the students have picked out are so different. Um, that you can tell just so many, you know, different vignettes from these soldiers. Um, in terms of most intriguing death stories, um, I think one of them that always stands out is um, James Bedell. <laughs> I was hoping you would say that. Oh, that's so Because yeah. who can forget that image oh of the God. skull, the Did fractured skull? Did the students skull. see the skull? Uh, just an image of it, just not the actual it, okay. thing. Um, but he he sent away to inquire if he could use that image, uh, and luckily he got information. He got um, you know the the free pass, the green light. Um, but yeah, so James Bedell um, was a member of the cavalry, Michigan cavalry, fought at East Cavalry Field, July third. So that in and of itself is different. We hadn't had a cavalry mm-hmm. uh, killed at Gettysburg profile. But then the way in which this guy ultimately dies was really interesting because he's taken prisoner. So you think, okay, where is this going? He's disease. You know, he's going to die of dysentery like everybody else. Yes. Yeah. How is this going to end? Um, apparently, he is not a very good prisoner. Um, he gets into a fight with his Confederate captors, and he receives a severe saber slash to the head. Um, which does significant damage to his skull. And so this, you know, speaks to those ideas of um, this wasn't necessarily, oh, this cooey, cooey, brother against brother war. This is savage warfare that happened here. Uh, And that's kind of a a check uh, for those people who seem to go on the brother versus brother route. The story on the profile says that as they're leading them off the field, um, he's not walking fast enough. Yes, and so the officer just slashes him on the head yes. and leaves him for dead. Leaves him on the side of the road. Yes. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and he doesn't die. Right. And he's later found by a union patrol mm-hmm. and taken back to the hospital. Right. And he is in that hospital basically as a vegetable for a month, month and a half, I think it was. It's almost two months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oozing brain matter from his skull. So again, ideas of the good death. When this guy signs up to fight, he has probably this notion of, you know, wheeling his own saber in battle, you know, maybe dying at the forefront of a gallant charge. This is how this guy dies. He's basically wasting away in a bed with brain matter oozing from his head. And he's conscious the whole time. So he's aware of this and how emasculating this experience is. Um, But then, of course, the really intriguing part is after he dies, uh, his body becomes used as basically a medical oddity, a medical specimen, which speaks to, again, the evolving field of medicine during this time period and the different roots from there. But then also how his body is buried without the head. The skull is shipped off to be studied for its medical anomalies and then put on display somewhere. So again, Victorian notions of the good death are completely contradicted when it comes to this guy. Uh, whose body has been sacrificed for science. Um, and, you know, to this day, James Bedell is buried basically as the headless horseman uh, <laughs> with the skull still missing. And we have that very... Not missing. Well, well missing. No, we, we know, know where, where it is. Body, exactly. Yeah. The horseman doesn't know where it is. That's right. <laughs> He's looking for it. That's right. Well, here's, here's something. Uh, I'll read it from the profile here. Um, this is from Skull Fractures of with Injury of the Brain. Is that a book? What is that I from? think that must have been the medical journal uh, that it was it written says, up Yeah, in. surgeon in charge of the camp, a page entitled, oh, okay, this is from a surgeon, yeah. Henry Janes. Um, okay, so he describes the wound as, wounded on the left side of the cranium by a saber stroke crushing the skull from a point inch above, one inch above the, hmm, why did I read this? <laughs> inch above the lam, lamdoidal, <laughs> lamdoidal suture extending anteriorly nearly four inches on a line parallel to the sagittal, sagittal suture. <laughs> okay. We know exactly so what that we all, means. We all know what that means, right? Um, but anyway, so later on, uh, so here's what it says. On August 30th, things took a sudden turn for the worst. He had a severe chill and his pulse increased rapidly. He remained in the state for 16 hours. The doctors wrote, 
or the doctor wrote, the brain protrudes from the wound and he is entirely blind. Stomach very irritable, which that had to be pleasant. Uh, mind perfectly clear. James Bedell died at five o'clock on August 30th. His last few hours had been extremely painful, yet his mind had remained clear through it all. He was conscious through the hours uh, of severe chill, stomach pain, and eventual blindness, and all he could do was wait to die. Bedell died in a slow and extremely painful way, far from home and anyone he knew. Although he retained his mental clarity, the other aspects of his death in no way fit the Victorian ideal of the good death, nor his pre-war expectations about what life or death of the Union Cavalryman might resemble. Um, and then, yeah, and then they, they took his head. Yeah. Well, no, he was buried near Camp Letterman and right. then moved over to the cemetery exactly. where they took yeah. his head. Mm -hmm. And um, and you can go and see it today, right? Yeah. Or, um, or can you just see a picture of it? I don't know if it's still on display. It might just be in a collection. Okay. Because yeah. it's, well, where is it? What did you say it was? Um, okay, hold on, hold on. I'll it, get to it. It's somewhere down here. It's not Philadelphia, is it? No, it's in uh, Silver Spring. Silver Spring. Silver Maryland, Spring. Yeah. yeah. What's the name of the place there? Oh, uh, National Museum of Health and Medicine in Silver Spring, Maryland. I have to go see it. And the picture of it is horrifying. It is. It to is. think that he lived with that hole in his head for uh, two months right. after receiving it. I mean, talk about migraines. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Right, right. Um, one of the ones that uh, Bob was reading about was George Buck of the 20th Maine. Uh-huh. Bob, did you have any questions about George Buck or anything you noticed about that that you wanted to... Uh, no, I, I wanted to hear Ash, Dr. Ashley continue with what her stories are. Um, All right. I, well, I will talk about George Buck on tours sometimes. Oh, okay. Kind okay. of as he's a reflection of Chamberlain. Yes. Um, yes. But uh, I want to hear what, what All right. So, yeah. So, stories then you why like. don't you, what are some other ones that you like? So, let's see. Another one that, that stuck out to me was a uh, minion, not actually. Um, That's our other one. Yeah, of the, uh, the second Maryland. So, he was an interesting story um, because obviously he's a Confederate soldier buried in the National Cemetery amongst Union soldiers. So, there was a mistake there amidst mm -hmm. the administrative mm -hmm. chaos. Um, not the only one of which I'm sure you're one. aware, which yes. might be a future study for some future students. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Um, and so this guy was interesting, and this student who who took on the soldier um, has just done a, a wonderful job. He's done several of these profiles, um, but he was able to turn Minyanot into a case study of um, the complications, the ambivalences of Maryland, of being a border state during the Civil War, mm. because Minion starts out fighting for the Union Army. And then early in the summer of 61, he changes direction, and he decides he's going to cast his lot with the Confederacy. Um, of course, Maryland itself is a state basically divided uh, during the entire Civil War. And so he kind of embodies um, those complications, that ambivalence. Um, but then also when he's fighting here on Culp's Hill, he is shot and likely killed um, by one of his own fellow Marylanders. And so, again, that it is the brother versus brother war. You do have the stories, and I'm not sure if you subscribe to the idea that Marylanders were necessarily always crossing the lines after the fighting at Culp's Hill and holding each other and giving each other water. I'm sure a lot of that is romanticized, but it did happen. We know mm -hmm. that it happened um, in certain instances. Um, but it complicates that story in that those things did happen. But these guys, on the other hand, right before the battle was starting and right in the midst of the battle, their leader was basically saying horrible things like, you know, kill them all, you know, spare no one. That's not the brother versus brother <laughs> romantic portrayal no. of war. And then the way that, you know, Minion not because of this very mixed up identity, he dies not too far from Maryland, you know, right over the Maryland border, um, even though he was from, you know, further south. Um, but then he's buried surrounded by Union soldiers. And so even in death, he has this kind of confused legacy, which yeah. you know, Maryland kind of does too, kind of ambivalent, you know, mm -hmm. on the fence. And so I just thought it was masterful the way that he was able to take this one soldier and delve into all of these political complexities and, you know, identity questions about where do Marylanders fit in Civil War memory? Where mm -hmm. does this guy fit in memory? He did a great job. With yeah. that. Um, it, it, it's interesting because I know your focus is also on memory, monumentation, mm -hmm. trying to get into the context of the culture of the time. Yeah. And even today, that, that monument to the second Maryland. Yes. 
it doesn't say, as the other Maryland units do at the bottom, Maryland's tribute to her loyal sons, yes. mm, right? Yes. Is that even there, there's, there's pains of the war are still being seen or right. or the fact that they had to declare their name yes. was the second Maryland, but <laughs> right. they carve above it that yes. we were the first Maryland and our name was changed. Today. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, that story is a whole other thing that, that Ryan was able to go into um, in terms of the memory battle is still very much visible today on yeah. the monument itself. Yeah. Um, so did, that's a favorite. Did Maryland pay for that monument too? I think it was the. Uh, are you talking about the state monument the, the, of the early two thousand? The, the second, or the, no, the second uh, the, Maryland. The one that's up there at the Lesser yeah. Summit of Culps Hill. No, I believe that was the veterans. They they're, did they're that from one. Baltimore area. Yeah. So you know, Baltimore is what fifty two miles away. It's not that hard for them to come visit their monument. Sure. No, and, no, no. And, but but the state because uh, you said oh, you did the state out, appropriate any funds to help them? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I don't think so, but I don't know. Because you pointed out that the on the the loyal ones, they uh, the union ones, they yeah, put, you know does loyal say loyal songs, right? right? But I'm wondering if they yeah, but I think that's both Southern, sides I, or I don't think so, but I don't know. It's a yeah, good question. Do you know? Question. What, I don't. Because I, I found it interesting that that um, I read somewhere that the Confederate. Soldiers got pensions from the United States government. Is that right? Or was that in Chris's? Uh, it was in Chris's interview the other day. He, he said something about that. He was mentioning that, that and, and when he mentioned that, I was wondering. I don't think that's from the United States government. Well, who pension. would that be from? The states from the, from the states. State. Yeah, yeah. The, the states state themselves. Pensions. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Because that didn't make sense to me. Right. I was like, right. Wait a second. Well then, let's just all start wars against the country, and then when it's over, we'll just right. get a pension. Ask for some money. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, Dr. Lusky or Dr. Ashley or Ashley, whatever, um, you seem so young to me too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the the what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, Dr. Carmichael's class. This comes out of yes, right. I see many similarities though from yes. his work and emphases to this. Mm -hmm. So. Which influenced which and how, what is that like? Um, well, because he was, I think, the, the founder of this project, I had been in conversations with him because I was working as a consultant with the Institute uh, while he was teaching this class and he had floated this idea. And so we talked about it um, as he was setting it up, but he was the original um, founder of it. So it definitely has its roots in what I call the Carmichaelian uh, interpretation <laughs> of history. But I have to say, I was a student of Dr. Carmichael's at West Virginia University. He was my grad school advisor. So my academic work has definitely been heavily influenced, influenced by his approach too, sure, to history. Sure. Um, and certainly I you know, had read several parts of drafts of his book while it was being written and he had talked a lot about it um, with many colleagues and friends, uh, myself included. And so that had a huge impact, I think, on me when I was going through these students' work is trying to help them take those ideas um, of pragmatism, uh, particularly and sentimentalism, and try to apply those uh, to the work. And you know, when we were talking a little bit earlier about um, having some empathy, having some um, understanding of these soldiers' humanity, even the ones who you know don't fit our our contemporary you know code of morals, um, I think that's something that we can get out of Pete's book as well. That I try to get the students to understand, um, understanding how they adapt to situations that really challenge their fundamental faith. Like Philip Hamlin, when he goes into the war, a very religious soldier. Um, has certain ideas about how to behave in camp. He's going to be righteous. He's not going to drink, gamble, you know, mm. get with women, et cetera, et cetera. Then he realizes these things don't exactly, you know, hold true once you get into the midst of camp life and his faith becomes challenged. Um, he never loses it, but he molds it. He adapts it to the new situation. Right. He has new standards for himself as an individual, not that he became morally corrupt by any means, um, but he is also challenged in terms of his political understandings of the war, and he has to kind of rethink, retool, how does my approach to the war change when I've seen these atrocities on the battlefield, when I'm losing faith in our commanders, mm. when generals are flying out the window, you know, left and right. Um, and so that's one of the things that I was trying to get Cameron, who wrote that profile, to understand was the pragmatism um, and un also an understanding of this guy's evolving humanity, um, trying to, to really get in touch with the inner world of Philip Hamlin in the way that, that Pete does so much in his book. Right. And an another connection 
in that there's the same soldier being focused on. Mm -hmm. John Partington, mm -hmm. uh, Corporal in the 24th Michigan, he is the first soldier we're introduced to, I believe, in, in, the, in, the in Carmichael's book in the introduction. Yes. yes. And I notice he's here too. Does that, did someone say, oh, I'm going to start there? Or did Dr. Yes. Carmichael or you or someone say, well, why don't you start here? So Pete, actually, I'm pretty sure that Pete gave that student Partington. That was a student from his class. So that okay. was one of the original profiles okay. that came out. Um, and I, I believe Pete, you know, said, I, I have some, some great stuff. Uh, here you go. Um, so I think that's where that came from. I should note that we have a student who's working on John Futch, which oh, I don't know if Pete yeah. talked yeah, about yeah, Futch, yeah, but yeah, usually the name comes yeah, up. Yeah. Um, and uh, working on Charlie Futch, rather, because John, you know, survives. Right. Um, so that's going to be coming up as well. So definitely Pete's hand is, is seen throughout the project, either in the soldiers selected or in just the way that they're being interpreted or thought nice. about. Um, I know Pete often gets a question with his book, you focus on a handful of soldiers. Are they representative? Um, and I know he can bristle sometimes at that, understandably, because I get the same question about this website. You know, we're not going to do all 7,000. Um, so are these representative soldiers that we have? Well, as much as you can say representative, there was no one common soldier who shared all of the same traits. All right. of these soldiers were so very different. And yet in them, we can see overlapping patterns and trends. So you can draw out certain universal themes from them, even at the same time as you recognize their individual stories and their individual humanity. So that's another part where Pete's work has definitely influenced the way that I encourage the students to approach. So if life. not all 7,000, then where? How, where does it stop? However many, however long the project goes on for. Until until people either lose interest in doing it or funding, I guess. Is Pretty funding much. an issue with this stuff? Or? You know, the funding isn't really an issue at this point because it's all in-house. So we okay. have these student fellows. We have a, a funding line to pay the student fellows. Mm -hmm. um, and then we use just very little money taking the students down to Washington okay. for these. So it's not archives. okay. So it's not funding. It's just yeah. a matter of whether you lose interest or not. Or yeah, yeah. So um, I don't think I don't think you should. Nobody should ever lose interest because it's. It, I think you should get to all seven thousand. And even if there's no story for any of them, right. just put the name there yeah. and just say no story. And who knows might see it and go, well, that, well, hell, that was my great great grandpappy, and you know, right. I can I can give you the story, you know, and then and then that's how you put it all together. Right. I think it, it's, it's such a cool idea, and it can be so so much bigger than it already is. Yes, um, you just have to, you know, get, we have to just get it out there and get people going there and checking it out. Right, right. And and I mean, if people, I mean, look, the worst you guys could do is say no. Right. If somebody calls and says, sure. "Hey, I want to help and do this," and you say, "Nah, thanks, but no thanks," but people should do that anyway, right? Because sure. you never know what's going to come across your radar. Yeah, absolutely, so. absolutely. And again, if they have records or anything, you know, that they're willing to share photocopies, I mean, that can be the starting place uh, yeah. for further conversation. So then, if uh, how would people get in touch with you? Um, so they we've gotten comments through the website um, you can leave a, a comment it doesn't show up publicly but we get an email um, some people will look us up um, you know online they'll send civil war at gettysburg.edu which is our email address an email sometimes they'll look up our phone number on the website and they'll call in that way um, so a couple different ways that people can get in touch okay yeah good do you i'm just still ex exploring this how do you decide out of a sea of so many and I know you said that, that you started out with just the dead who are buried here, but then it, it, yes. it grew a little bit. Is, is there any um, governing principle mm -hmm. that's keeping you from, we want a certain ratio at least? Yeah. And Reb versus Yank. Yeah. Um, region of the country. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would like to to have roughly 50-50 ultimately um, 50 -50 in terms of Reb union, Yank? Yeah, okay. union uh, confederate. Um, I would like to have a diversity of um, units uh, where they fought on the battlefield, um, definitely different state representation, although, as I said, you can get two very different stories out of even the same regiment, so I'm not opposed mm. to that. Um, the, the one kind of guiding principle that I give the students when they start is that the soldier has to have a digitally accessible compiled service record if they're not going to be able to come with us to the archives. So if you go on Fold 3, for instance, 
you can get the compiled service record for many soldiers. But there are several states that do not have theirs digitized yet. Mm. And so that kind of wipes out, you know, certain soldiers, certain possibilities. Now, if the student is going down to the archives and the timing works out so that they can get the service record from the archives, um, that's that's not a problem anymore. The other issue is, of course, with Confederates, the the widow's pension, we don't have those records um, easily accessible to mm. the students. So it's much easier to get a richer story if you pick a Union soldier, number one, who would have a widow's pension, um, but also one that's accessible. Some of them, their mothers or their you know widows didn't apply for a pension. Um, the paperwork isn't there. Um, some of them have it, but it's um, at the, ar the archive, so they're not accessible digitally. So it just depends on the timing of things. If we have to go kind of fast track, fast paced, I try to get them to get things that they can pull online themselves without going to the archives. If we know we're working with a longer period of time and they can go down to the archives at their own will, um, then you know they have a greater flexibility with who they pick. So there's at least two goals of this. One is to inform the public mm -hmm. about the lives that were snuffed out here at Gettysburg, mm -hmm. which is highly interesting to the public, at least right. nerdy public like people yeah. who listen to this podcast. Right, right, right. <laughs> Um, but the other, of course, is you're an educational institution and you're teaching young researchers how to research. Yes. And sometimes I can see where those are in opposition to each other. Yes. So I'm wondering if you can't make extra credit for someone to, it, it would probably be pretty short, but it might be longer than you think. This, this female Confederate who's buried after Pickett's charge. I mean, you're not going to find much... <laughs> on that right mm -hmm. except right. you are in you are introducing this whole concept of yeah there were women <laughs> right who right. disguised their sex and fight right and that maybe that can branch off yeah. in, into something else here so yeah yeah just that might not be something that teaches research skills although it could it could, it could. Yeah. Yeah. Other, yeah. other yeah. Venues, sure so. do you have the name no that's that's the whole no thing i think it was um uh was it pet was it given himself it was. It was in the second quarter. One, Maybe it one was of those Hayes's general. I, I was going to say Hayes, but Maybe I don't think it was Hayes's. Hayes. But there, there is a a reference to the burial of a dead woman Confederate. Interesting. And the idea uh, is she must have kept her identity a secret as yeah. long as she was alive. Yeah. But, but couldn't. How did yeah. they? How did he That's say amazing. that they discovered it was a female? Were they like rooting through her pockets or something? I don't know. I don't know. There was. There was. And that's why I want. Dr. Yeah. Lusky's yeah. students to do all yeah, the maybe, hard work yeah. so I can just tell the story on the battlefield. <laughs> right, yeah. all right. We'll just assign that to you guys to find out for us. Right, right. Well, uh, Dr. Ashley, it was great having you on. Thank um, you so much. This is a really Absolutely. cool project. I encourage everybody to go check it out. It's killedatgettysburg.org, not com. Dot org, and contact them if uh, you, you you think you can help or you have someone that uh, um, you you know died here and you want to learn more about it or whatever it may be. But uh, help it grow. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Thank guys. you again, Bob, for your great questions. Are you right over there? What yes, you Matthew. <laughs> I, I, what are you I've doing? got the deer in the headlight <laughs> looks because one of us I think just mispronounced Doctor Ashley's last name. It's it's Lusky, isn't it? Yeah. Lusky. Okay. Good. What did you say? I, I thought I heard you say Lasky. I didn't even say her last name. I just said Doctor Ashley. Oh, that's what. <laughs> good. But I it's Doctor Ashley Whitehead Lusky, like I said in the intro, which we didn't do which yet. We didn't do right. yet. Which so, is why. I which is why sure. you're all confused. I've gotten all pronunciations. Lasky, Lusky. Yeah. Yeah. No, Lusky is pretty simple. McCluskey. McCluskey. Some people just add a Mick in front no. of it. Well, that's a good yeah. one. Matt Actually, I like that. Yeah. Doctor McCluskey. That's yeah, what I'm going to call it. <laughs> close <laughs> all right well thank you all for listening okay there we go thanks actually awesome. that was great that was yeah, fun. That was